So what I thought I'd show was some of the simulations that we've done on, uh, within our research group here at Leicester. So this is an image here of the Milky Way. This is real data, so this is taken with a, a large number of different telescopes. And what you can see here is the, the disk of the Milky Way, the central bright region is the bulge of the Milky Way, and some of the satellite galaxies, so that for example there is the Ma Large Magellanic Cloud. And if we zoom in on the central bit, so just on this central square, roughly six million years ago, there were some new stars formed at the very center of the Milky Way, because we can see those uh, at the present time, and we know they're about six million years old. So a few years ago, we asked the question, what would happen if some gas that was involved in the process of forming those stars fell onto the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. So we know that there's a very massive black hole. It's about four million times the mass of our sun. So it's very heavy. And when gas falls onto a black hole like that, a lot of radiation is released. So we wanted to know what would happen when that radiation hit the gas that surrounds the Milky Way. And what you see here is at the center of the Milky Way, we have the gas falling onto the black hole. And this is the gas around the Milky Way, the density of it and the temperature of it. And what you can see is that as a result of this small amount of energy that was input at the very center, you blow this huge bubble around the galaxy and if we were running a simulation of the lower part of the galaxy we'd see the same thing. The disk of the Milky Way is here and the reason why this is interesting is we live about there, so about somewhere between seven and eight thousand parsecs from the center of the Milky Way and as you can see even though the black hole is only at the very very center it's able to produce effects which stretch all the way out to us and beyond. And so one of the things we're looking at now is to study that process in more detail. So this particular simulation was done on the previous generation of Dirac computers, but we've now started doing more detailed ones, focusing in on the very, very central parts. So this is work that was done by one of our current PhD students, Martin Bourne, uh, using the Dirac 2 computer. And this time we start off with the gas looking very clumpy, because that's how we think it would have looked at the time that the Milky Way was forming. What happens when the energy is input into the gas is it's much more complicated. So it's much more complex than just a nice simple bubble moving out. In some regions where the gas was thinner, the radiation and gas and hot gas can move out very quickly. And in other regions, it's able to just compress the gas that's there and some of it even falls back into the black hole itself. So what we've learned from this simulation is the process of feedback, as we call it, where gas falls onto a black hole and releases energy, can do two things. We used to think it would just prevent new stars from forming because it would blow away all the existing gas. But we've seen from simulations like this, it can actually force more gas to fall into the black hole and keep that cycle going. So it's actually a self-sustaining process. And this is work that uh, we're currently doing further simulations. And the, some of the jobs that you saw running on the, the machine when we were in the machine room, some of them were doing this kind of simulation. Um, and other work by my student, Claire Cashmore, is also looking at the impact of this on the small galaxies around the Milky Way. So these kind of jobs would be impossible to do on a normal desktop because they would take so long to do each individual run that we wouldn't be able to understand what was going on. Because if you think about it, when you do one of these runs, we don't know exactly how the galaxy looked in the past. So we have to make some assumptions and try something, see what the outcome is, and then go back to the beginning and say, OK, what would happen if we changed it very slightly? Now, if it took two years to do each of the runs, we'd never be able to make any progress and learn anything because we could only ever do one simulation. But because we can use Dirac, we're able to do lots of these simulations so we can explore a whole lot of different initial conditions. And then we can actually say, the Milky Way must have looked like this in the past because we know that that's the only way it would look the way it does in the present. So it's kind of a bit reverse engineering with a huge bunch of what ifs. Very much so. So that's the, the thing with astronomy, um, which makes it different from many other subjects um, or, or any, many other types of science is we can't do experiments like normal science can. So we have to, we look at the universe as we see it now. We can look into the past because we can see things that are 
are far away and the light from them has taken millions or billions of years to reach us. So we're seeing galaxies near us as they are now and far away from us as they were a long time in the past. But what we can't do is take the Milky Way and turn it upside down and look at it from the other side. We can only look at it from where we're sitting. And so what we have to do then instead is we use supercomputers. They're like doing experiments, but for astronomy. And we build galaxies. And these galaxies that we're building, we can look at them from any angle that we want to. And we can change how the physics uh, is incorporated into these galaxies. And then we can see, do they look anything like the galaxies that we see in the real universe? If they do, then we can say, OK, we think we understand how galaxies work. But if they don't, then we can go back and say, well, if all galaxies are bigger than the ones that we find in our simulations, or all galaxies are much smoother than the, uh, the image that we see here, then we can say there's something wrong with our simulation. We need to do something different. We need to change some, some of our assumptions. And so we've mentioned Direct3. Uh, is that what's next? And how long will that take to, to come together? So Dirac 3 is what we're hoping will be the new system and we're hoping that will be uh, supported at some point in the next couple of years. So we're currently in a process of designing what, uh, what we would need based on our exp the, the science that we're going to, to try and do in the next five years. And so we're very much hoping that we'll be supported in, in putting this together. And bigger, better? Yes, bigger, better, different. Um, and it's going in our current vision of it, it has new services, so it has a data service which is very focused on problems where not only are we doing big simulations, but we're comparing them to very large observational data sets. So that's with a view to modeling uh, data coming from satellites like the Gaia satellite that was launched in, at the end of 2013. Where do you yep. start with a project like this? Where, what's the beginning? So, it's had, it, there's been a long tradition of doing theoretical astrophysics and particle physics in the UK. So there was already, there's been a, a very long uh, history of people doing these kind of simulations. And originally it was individual centres um, were would have their own computers. So for example, uh, Leicester 15 years ago uh, had its own computer cluster and then it set up what was called the UK Astrophysical Fluids facility, which was uh, a national facility for people doing simulations of uh, gas flows um, on various different scales. And the, so that system was a national facility but was still housed at Leicester and for a long time all the research of this kind was done on individual group machines and then some of the groups would apply for time on big uh, international facilities or national facilities in the UK. And what we realised um, in 2008 and 2009 was that we could get much more science out if we could have machines that were a bit bigger and more powerful than the machines that an, an individual group could have. But we didn't want to put all the money into one system because different scientific problems need different computer architectures. So one big system wouldn't be optimal for the kind of science that we're doing. So that's why we decided to, in 2009, we had a large set of machines. So Dirac 1 was a set of machines which was essentially uh, larger versions of what everybody already had with a view to Dirac 2 consolidating into the five machines that we have now. And so there was a process whereby we worked out over those three years from 2009 to 2012 what were the core architectures that we needed to have in Dirac 2. And we're undergoing the same process now in the hope that we'll be able to upgrade to uh, Dirac 3 at some point in the next couple of years. And again, the process is we're going through our, we've gone through our science, the science questions that we work on to try and understand exactly what architectures we're going to need in the future. Dirac 2, so that's the current system, cost, uh, we got 15 million pounds for hardware, so that was the original capital investment from the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. And so that was divided up among the various machines. Um, the running costs are paid for by STFC, so that's the Science and Technology Facilities Council. That's the research council that funds research in the UK for particle physics and for astrophysics. 
uh, among other things. And so the running costs of it are about one and a half million pounds a year, and that includes electricity and the staff costs. Because yeah, it must um, must take a bit of juice, does it? <laughs> yes, it does. But the main and uh, a key aspect of Dirac as well was the design of the systems to use as little power as possible. So they are very efficient, and most importantly, our data centres are uh, very uh, are as efficient as they can be. So, for example, the one in Leicester is passively cooled until the outside temperature is uh, above 19 degrees and even then it's only when it gets above 24 degrees that it becomes uh, a proper air conditioning system. Uh, below that it, it uses a lot less power and so that means where in the past the cooling of the uh, of a cluster would take a huge fraction of its of its electricity. In fact now we're getting uh, what's called a PUE of about 1.2 or less so that means for every unit of electricity that we put into actually running the computer, we only use 0.2 of a unit to uh, cool it. And so that means that we're doing our bit for the environment as well. It's, it's a very fine balance because you also want to get as much, uh, so when the, the chips are running at their full capacity, they're using more power. So there is uh, an element that we have to be as efficient as we can. And we're actually working on that now to improve our codes because how you write your software can also affect how much electricity you use. And in view of the environmental impact of obviously the use of electricity, we're now looking to make our software more energy efficient in the sense that we'll be looking at things like if you want to write this to write a, a particular output to disk, that takes some extra electricity is do you need to write it out as often as, as you are doing and again the length of the runs in the future we imagine will uh, one of the considerations will not just be how many cores do we have but how many kilowatts do we have and how many uh, how many units of electricity are we prepared to spend on, on this bit of science there's a lot of technology changes going on at the moment in the on the hardware side. Um, so, for example, there's a, a within many uh, computer systems you're seeing things like uh, many core systems becoming very common. So uh, that's things like graphics cards um, or the, the Xeon Phi cards, and these are very useful when you're doing big calculations because they're very power efficient but you've got to be able to use them efficiently if you're going to get the full uh, compute power out of them. And so most of our codes at the moment need work in order to be able to take advantage of the new hardware. And if we can do that, which is something that we're actively working on at the moment, we'll be able to take advantage of the increased power of these systems and the reduced energy requirements of them in the next generation. But it's a massive task because we've got codes which have been developed over a long period of time and so it's a huge software engineering task to, to rewrite them and redesign them because it's often, it's not just a case of translating them from one uh, coding language to another, it's actually redesigning the algorithms because sometimes the algorithm will translate directly to a, a GPU without much modification, but in most cases it won't. So we have to go through every step of the algorithm, work out which bits can work on only on a traditional, uh, a traditional CPU and which ones can work on uh, uh, an accelerator card. And then we make sure that we port the bits to the accelerator card. But while it's doing its work, we need to have something for the, the CPU to be doing as well. So it's a, a very fine balance um, and, and a very large task. So we're hoping to set up a software engineering team within Dirac who will be able to take charge of that for us. So those, I mean, this is, as I understand it, a GPU is basically um, a, a piece of hardware which is optimized for doing lots and lots of number crunching over and over and over. Mm -hmm. But they can be number crunching for physics as well, can they? Yes, so the key thing with GPUs and any accelerators is they're very good at doing certain types of calculation and they can do those calculations in bunches rather than just one at a time. So if you can write your problem as a set of Rep repetitive calculations that you can just hand over to, to the accelerator card to do, then it works extremely well. And it's, it's essentially breaking down the, the process that you're trying to calculate into those steps which match the capabilities of the, of the GPU or 
whatever accelerator card. That's the, that's the tricky part. So it's a bit like, perhaps if you're writing it for a CPU, you're writing, I don't know, this is going to be a terrible analogy, but I'm going to work, work on it anyway. Okay. Um, people getting on motor, a series of motorbikes, one at a time, to zoom off. But now mm -hmm. a series of buses have arrived, and mm -hmm. you can't just put one person on each bus. Mm -hmm. Would that be a really, that's, yeah, that, really ropey that, analogy? That is, that, that's a reasonable analogy, <laughs> and so what we're, we have to do is work out, we know what the buses can take, and we have to work out how we can rewrite our algorithms to produce to have require that kind of calculation. And for some kind of problems, there are natural ways of doing it. So those codes were already in the process of um, of modifying. Um, but for some problems, it may be that we can't use those kind of architectures because they're just not uh, not suitable for us. So we're, that's what we're trying to work out now. With we're doing a whole series of benchmarks and software uh, engineering projects to try and get that to to optimize the codes that we have. And is that um, is that going to be Dirac three then? Is that is that what you're working on for that? Yes. So Dirac three will have we expect to have a, a component of accelerators. Um, we. It'll, be, it'll vary from machine to machine. So we're, again, assuming that Dirac 3 follows the same basic structure of having several, uh, several distributed machines. We would expect some of them will have a large component of accelerators, others might not, because we'll be trying, again, to design it around what the scientists need. Because that's been the key strength of the Dirac facility is it's been designed with the science questions in mind. So each machine is optimized for a particular type of science, and that's why it's been such a, a productive facility. We're not just saying we would like to have a, a big computer and then going to the manufacturers and saying, here, here is, you know, this is the type of computer we want. Instead, we go to them and we say, this is the type of problem we're trying to solve. What architectures can we use to solve that problem? So it's very much a, a process, uh, a two-way process, where we're listening to what they can offer, and then we can try to recast some of our problems in terms that match the, the hardware and vice versa. How do you classify something as a supercomputer? So it's usually in terms of uh, the how connected it is. So essentially, each of the individual cores in the Dirac facility is the same as the cores in your PC at home. What makes it a supercomputer is that those cores are part of a bigger system, so they're all connected together. So as I said earlier, if you just took a thousand home computers and put them in a room, that wouldn't make them a supercomputer. It would just be a thousand computers in a room. So what makes them a supercomputer is that they're all connected together. So I can use them as if they were one big computer. And that allows me to do problems in maybe a week that would take much, much longer. So maybe many months or even many years if I was trying to do them on, on one of the computers at a time.